for Brandon. He can't help it. Hello, Hello everybody. <laughs> Welcome to the Cubist. My name is Bill Corey. I am the Cubist, and I'm back. Holy crap! It's been what three weeks since I've been on the show, on what is ostensibly my show. I don't know. Anyway, anyway, but we're back, and Patrick is me in the chat so i'm not and i might also be in the chat because i'm this is all very confusing i'm just yeah. going to start introducing people hi daryl how are you daryl andrews from maple games is here Woohoo! happy to be here hi daryl daryl your hat collection has always been amazing but i gotta say that might be the prettiest one yet thank you had, thank you very much Brewer's hat here somewhere to wear but i see i'm telling you that's pretty cool too <laughs> it's not a maple especially, games hat but I'll especially right now <laughs> speaking of speaking of especially right now hi brandon how are you brandon Kemp? Uh, i'm good how are you bill i am well the arsenio hall to my ed mcmahon wait yeah. no i did that backwards damn it oh, oh. all right that's fine anyway patrick hillier is also here patrick hi hey i'm sporting a dayton dragons hat because that's the only kind of baseball hat i own you are well, and it's a dragon, which is a decent segue into our main topic later. Oh, so, I like what you did there. Oh, that, was, that, was, that was totally the reason I wore it, yes. Was it really? No. Okay. Wow. Then really, in that that's case, the only hat I had. Holy cow. In that case. <laughs> I mean, I have like 85 Dayton Dragons hats. Like, anytime you go to a Dragons game, they give you a hat. Please take a hat. Please, please yes. wear this. And so I've got you know, a bunch of them, so. It is indeed. Matt in the chat has pointed out that it is hat night. It is indeed hat night. I it's am free hat night. Everyone in the chat room gets a free hat from a Daryl. Like from the dragon. Yeah. <laughs> there you go, Daryl. <laughs> He's like, wait, wait, stop. <laughs> stop spending money. That'd be, that'd be a cool Kickstarter bonus. I've never seen that before. Yeah. Well, we, we do have hats, but they're yeah. an add on. Yeah. Well, that's what they're I'm saying. Add -on. An add on. Yeah. This is in the Kickstarter for Dragon Boats of the Four Seas you would be talking about, which, by the way, there is a link for in the description to this here YouTube video that people are watching right now. So if you click on that there link, it will send you straight to the Kickstarter so you can check it out as we talk about it later. But first, as always, let's uh, our, always our first segment after intros, of course, is what we've been playing lately. Patrick, I want you to start because I'm very curious. Then we're just going to kind of go down the row here. Patrick, what sure. have you been playing lately? Well, it, yeah, today uh, was a, a, the, a day off today. Uh, it's it's Canadian Thanksgiving, according to our guest, but it's also uh, Indigenous People's Day Indigenous here. Indigenous People's Day here in America, and I had the day off because uh, I'm not a government employee, but we get the government holidays off for some odd reason. I had nothing to do, so I put out my Halloween decorations and was in a Halloweener mood. And um, I stopped by the game store and saw um, a bloody end behind me. And I've played that before and decided to buy it. Cause I was, I was kind of, you know, October feel like playing something spooky and weird. And I've played this in the past. So uh, I haven't played it recently, um, but I've played it several times before. And so just doing brief, a brief um, discussion on this and maybe do a buy it. Um, I think last year at this time, it reminds me uh, the, the, um, Cardboard Connage does a uh, Halloween episode, and I've I've done sort of like a spooky tale on their on their podcast for them, and uh, I did I did one on on that on that game, um, kind of a, a mock discussion or whatever a tale of like what it would be to be inside the game, and um, anyway, so it's a it's a game where you are a, uh, a it's a creepy premise right you're an innkeeper and you're trying to you're you're poor so you're trying to kill your residents uh guests um by uh by um and then burying them uh to get them get their money uh without the without the sheriff or the local constables or whatever um catching you and um you 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 build like sheds and things in your backyard which give you extra spaces to bury people and stuff it's just, it's just the creepiest sound game in the world but it has it has just sort of this light art uh style and sort of this cartoony way of presenting and that that makes it a little bit lighter than you would think but uh definitely definitely a fun little halloween game so it's definitely a play it um and and that's about all i was going to say about it 
I, I was going to say, it's not a particularly light game as far as gameplay goes, is that? No, 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 it's not. It's not super heavy, but it's definitely not light either. Middle of the road. It's Middle a, of the I'm, road, yeah. I'm just staring at the BGG page because I've and never had a chance to play it. It's basically just a card game. You have a little bit of a tableau where you're you know, laying down things, building a little bit of an engine while you're building these rooms up that allow you to give you special abilities. And there's different kinds of characters that uh, give you bonuses. You might try to get all of the the bishops or different characters types. Yeah, I, I, I love the game. I actually, mm-hmm. I would say it's a buy it because it's really affordable. I yes. think it's really underappreciated. It's it's under the radar. Not a lot of people I hear talking about it, but I think yeah. it's, it's, it's thinking in a good way. It's not like heavy, but it, it, you feel clever when you pull off moves. And uh, as long as the theme doesn't, you know, turn you off, then yeah. I think I think it's a buy it. There's yeah. part of me wonders if the theme is why it maybe is it sort of doesn't get a lot of buzz anymore because I it's it's very highly rated on BGG, right? It's yes. yeah. six ninety six, so it's a very well thought of game. Yep, um, but it is very affordable. Wow, like very. Yeah. <laughs> Look at, it's 24 bucks on Amazon. That's Yeah, because it is mostly just cards, as Patrick said. So sure. you, they, they make the game for a good price, but it's all right. Does it and now it shows on here that it plays solo? Have have any of you played I've it solo? I've never tried that. Yeah, I've, I've never tried sure that. I will. I get all opportunities. Maybe I'll bring it on my next trip. I'm going up to Ann Arbor alone. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah. All right. So the Bloody Inn is a play it from Patrick and a buy it from Daryl. I like it. I'm, I, I, did you, you didn't talk about the art? Never mind. We won't make you be the official mispronouncer. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't pull all that up. But it's yeah, fine. It's all French. It's, you know, Weber's all French. Yeah. yeah. Weberson's fantastic. He, he did like coup and, um, oh, okay. The other yeah, one that the he did. Farmer's game that's coming out on, uh, yeah. Oh, he did Kickstarter or Essen or something like that. Yep. And he's got Fuji, which is the new Wolfgang Warsh game coming from, um, uh, Fjordland. So he's yep. done, he's getting, he does a lot of good stuff. Goodness. Paul in the chat agrees, by the way, that it is a buy it. So Patrick, yeah, I, you have been outvoted. Okay. <laughs> I, I bought it. Yeah, you literally uh, bought it. Uh, <laughs> but it was it was only after a play. I was a little dubious at first. So that's my only Because of the theme? Because of the theme. I was a little I was a little gun shy of the theme. Yeah. I don't yeah. mind darker themes in games in general, but is mm-hmm. but they have to have sort of a whimsical feel to them. So like Gloom as a great example, I don't think it's a particularly good game personally. That's just me. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, but the theme is whimsical enough that you can get past the thoroughly soul crushingly depressing nature of what it is that you're actually talking about. Mm-hmm. And I this this doesn't look very whimsical on the cover, right? Like even that cover is sort of disturbing looking. Yeah, that looks yes. Know? So I can see why people would maybe pass it up. But Paul, I, Paul, yeah, Paul mentioned it too is a buy Paul and Kyle. Yep. Um you you get a vote now, Paul. Paul, Paul of course also you do. mentioned the the Carnies expansion, which I've not played. I saw that at the store. It's just a small little like almost a, de- a mini deck that you just probably throw in the game. Oh, interesting. Gotcha. I haven't tried that either. I just realized I have a different game I can talk about. I'm calling an audible when it comes to my turn. All right, moving on. Daryl. Yeah. What did you want to talk about? Well, I, I I put it up here a nice on display for anyone that's watching, but oh, nice. uh, anyone who's listening, you can't see this, but uh, Coinbra. <laughs> uh, Coinbra was uh, uh, a game published by Eggert Spiel, and... Uh, it's a phenomenal game. I can I can butcher the name of the designers if you'd like. Uh, <laughs> it is Virginio Gigli and Flaminia Brassini. Oh uh, man, we'll see. Whoa. We'll see if that's yeah, maybe in the Princess Bride. Yeah, I feel like it. You know, <laughs> but, um, honestly, I've I've already played it. I think three or four times in the last two weeks, and I haven't been playing a ton of games other than prototypes lately. So. It's got to be good if I keep coming back to it. There it is a, a dice drafting game. Who would have thought I would like that kind of thing? Yeah, weird, uh, right? But, uh, the neat twist is that you have these little, like if you picture like Torres or different games that have little castle uh, mm-hmm. plastic pieces, you sit mm-hmm. the dice inside them. And it's a way to then say like ownership of the different dice. So you can draft different colors, but you know who owns which dice. And then you use those as workers in the game so that you do bidding with them and they have kind of a nice uh, 
layering of strategy. So every choice you make has kind of like two or three ramifications, like, oh, it's this color, so that means something, but it's this number, it means something, and then you put it here, which means something. So those little layering makes every decision you make just feel excruciating in a good way. And uh, yeah, so I, I think it's a buy it. Um, I've already feel like I've got my money's worth from it. And uh, I think people should give it a try. It if you're not into Euros, you're not you're not gonna like this game. But if you <laughs> if you are, if you like, you know, crunchy, you know, lots of pass to victory kind of games with interesting choices, I think I think it's a buy it. Um, the only the only comment I've heard negative from other players, I don't feel this, but I've heard this at the table, is that some of the different choices you make feel like they're compartmentalized. So mm-hmm. kind of like there's a few like almost mini games happening. And so when you go through the phases of the game, it's kind of like this means something, this means something, this means something else. And so some people don't like, I've heard people kind of say they don't like that part of the game, but. Hmm. This feels like this, I, I was really looking forward to this one and I still am. I'm hoping to try it next month at uh, Capital City. Hang on, Capital City, what are the five C's, Brandon, help me. Capital, Capital City, City Cardboard Critics Convention. Cardboard Critics Convention. Okay, I just can never say it out loud. That's a mouthful. Um, it's I <laughs> know. Right? Call it five C. That's why we call it five C because then I don't know if that, I know what the hell's going on. Um, but yeah, I want to try it there. I but I've heard a fair number of people sort of grumping about this game, sort of like this wasn't what they thought it was going to be. I want to try it for sure because um, I think this sounds exactly like what I what I want. I have a question. The insert that I see that comes with the game. It's real. It looks like it was really well, yeah, engineered. Is it functional enough? It is, that you it feel is like... pretty functional. Let me open it up just to test it right here live. You know, you can't Don't get anything. Look at that. <laughs> but, <laughs> but I've been throwing it around in lots of different directions, and minus a few cards slipping around, everything's still in its spot. Nice. Yeah. Yeah, I'm just looking at the picture on BGG. It's I think like the third picture over. It's, now. I, I don't fully use it probably the proper way. So maybe, like, I still baggy a few things. There's okay. a lot for all of the discs. I don't I do not do that because it's too much gotcha. work. But Right on. Okay. I'm just always curious when, when manufacturers go the extra mile and try to provide you with a super functional insert, and then half the time it's garbage anyway. Yeah. So <laughs> Very cool. It's hard. It's hard to do it right. Yes, it is. Very cool, sir. Nice. All right, so Coimbra. Coimbra, am I saying that right? This is one of those words. That's that how I say it. I right. think so. It's a Portuguese city. Mm-hmm. Okay. On kind so. of that southwest shore. All right. Portuguese. Coimbra, is a buy it from you? It is. Perfect. I cannot wait to try it. I'm excited. Brandon? Yeah, Coimbra was a buy it for me, too, because that was the very first thing I bought Thursday morning at Gen Con, so... Nice. Yeah, and I've only gotten to play it once. But anyway, which is just like the game I'm going to talk about, which is Carpe Diem, which is the new um, Aaliyah Ravensburger title from Stefan Feld, which feels eerily like Castles of Burgundy without dice. So it instantly goes up for me, and I know there's ways to mitigate your dice rolls and everything in Castles of Burgundy, but they always annoy me because I have to use the word. Uh, Poor dice. I know it, they get a bad rap around here, and I and I feel bad sometimes. But it's basically kind of the same thing. Um, I'm not going to go really into it. Just we'll say I, I like how you draft the tiles instead of using dice to do it. You know, like you do in Castles of Burgundy, and you only get like two around or whatever you do. You're going to do you get like seven per round. I think this time is how it goes. But you've got a, for lack of a better word, a circular thing in the uh, in the middle of the board circle. And there are six different spots where your worker can be. And each different six spots has four different tiles. And so there's like a pentagram movement for that's my lack of better words. I couldn't think of how to do it. So with one from one spot, you could move to one of the other two spots opposite of it, right? There are seven sides. Seven sides. There you go. Seven gram. There you go. And and so that, that's what you can do. And you can move that way. And then when you move, you have to take a tile and then you build it in your in your city your area of the city it's really fun it, it is awfully castles of burgundy ish in that you are trying to complete things to gain the bonuses to give you the more actions to give you more things to score points on 
to do stuff like that. It's very point salad-y. Um, but it works really well. It's a little obtuse when you get that rule book. I think Ravensburger normally does a really good job. I kind of got a little bit lost at times, but once you start playing it, you see it, it's good. Okay. So I think it's that, the, that, that cover happened? looks like it's from like 1985. It's, it? it's an Alia box, that medium <laughs> Alia big box or box <laughs> kind of game. You know, it just fits in right in there with Puerto Rico. Yeah. But um, that's yeah. uglier than Puerto Rico by a fair <laughs> amount. Like that's, they, they seem to be like pushing the X, like they mashed on the ugly button a little. Oh, I've seen yeah. some ugly ones coming they're, from us. They're definitely working at it. <laughs> <laughs> like, <laughs> this is not stuck. offensive compared to some I've seen coming at Essence. So don't worry about um, it. Oh, um, <laughs> good. I think it works really well. It's a little lighter than Castles of Burgundy, I think. I think Castles of Burgundy has more choices. I think with the dice, you can maybe do a few more things. But I like this one, and I think it's going to play a lot faster. I, You know, there, for the life of me, I will not sit down and play a four-player game of Castles of Burgundy. No, in, in, I'll in, do it online, people. but not in Yeah, people, not with people. No. This I wouldn't hesitate to do. Um, hmm. I think it plays snappy, and it moves. And I, I, I enjoyed the heck out of it. We'll just say that. I think my quote is, this is probably the best Feld I've played in years. So, oh, Wow. Yeah, so when I was all gaga for Pulsar 2849, you described it as the Feldiest <laughs> Feld that ever Felded. That and, wasn't a Feld. <laughs> and that wasn't a Feld. And I, in the way that you said it gave me the impression that that was not a compliment. It is not. I do not normally like point salad games, especially when they feel... What is the term I want to use here? Uh, Pulsar is a perfectly fine game, right? It, it's it better just, than perfectly fine. It's excellent. It just That's feels fine. like it's you're doing things just to score points, and there's no other reason. And maybe that works for most people. It just didn't feel right to me. It feels like, okay, I guess I'll do that. Since you know that place is taken, I can do this and just score like one less point. You know what I mean? Okay. That's kind of what it feels like. This feels like I'm building something, and I'm working towards trying to accomplish things. The, the real neat thing is the scoring cards, but we won't get into it because I could talk another 10 minutes about those. Okay. Because the scoring cards are always different and uh, there's four rounds of scoring and you basically only get to score two cards each round. So you kind of choose it. And then once you've chosen a space, basically you score everything that's adjacent to that where you choose. So those two cards can never be scored again by anybody else. Unless okay. they would like above it. So it's really kind of neat. So it's all about optimizing, all about scoring points. It works. There you go. Is it a buy it? I don't know. Right now, you have to go to Amazon DE, but it should be here in what November. So, Robinsberger or Leah is usually really good about getting things here fairly quick. Gotcha. Okay. Um, I'm really surprised. I mean, Alea used to be like my favorite books. I'm really disappointed to hear that it was difficult. What's that? That used to be my books. uh, Real books. Those are uh-huh. my favorite rule books. Yeah, and they do the same thing. I mean, you know, down the side of the game, the, the yeah. thing, you get the examples and everything. It's just something about it, maybe, and maybe it was just me reading it too. You know, it, everything, once you play it, you realize what's going on and, and how you're going to do it. But reading it felt weird to me. Are you in the so. chat? Ben had a question. Um, I can't. Understand. Yes, there was lots of other things to do. I wasn't going to eat up a lot of time, Ben. Sorry. Okay. Um, <laughs> I mean, basically, yeah, you are, you're, you're moving your worker to choose a tile to build your building and that building can cause you to gain other benefits. And those benefits basically are going to score your points. You're building your city or you're part of the city. I think Ben, if I may, Brandon, tell me if I'm wrong here, I'm going to try and speak on your behalf. Sorry, yeah, like a little bit here. Texting I think, what, I think <laughs> what you were saying is that this feels like there is a, a thematic reason for doing things that are also scoring you points, where some games just feel like you're doing stuff. It may be thematic. I don't know. Maybe it's just that I'm doing something that I enjoy more. Oh, you know, and that's, <laughs> I, I just, and that's dice, completely, it's that's completely me. This. Um, and I realized yeah, that that's why I hesitated to say anything like that, but it may be just that I'm doing something that I enjoy doing more than just putting a ring around something because I didn't love it. Yeah. That's fine. You, you are, <laughs> you are allowed to be wrong with your opinion of Pulsar 24 game of 2017. That's fine. Yeah, You're allowed. I know. Um, it's definitely, I think a buy it once it gets here, I wouldn't necessarily pay the extra price to, to Amazon DE it yet. Board game bliss had copies at one time, so I don't know if they still do. Gotcha. Gotcha. Very cool. You like Feld, right. Yeah, definitely buy it. I'm, I, it. this is going to be at five C, right? Yeah. All right. Yeah. Excellent. I won't sell it off. All right. 
It's on the list. Add it to the list of stuff I'm definitely not going to have time to play all of in the three days that I'm going to be in Lincoln the Ozarks. I like it. You got it. All right. I want to quickly, I'm calling an audible. I had originally said I was going to talk about something else. I'm going to go really fast. I'm going to talk about Expedition, the role-playing card game. Uh, this is from Fabricate.io. Scott Martin is the designer. This is exactly what it sounds like. It's a role-playing game using only cards. Uh, it's very light. It uses a smartphone app that sort of functions as the quote-unquote DM of the thing. But really what it is is it's a choose-your-own-adventure book in app form. And then when you get to combats, you'll use the cards to drive the combat is really what it comes down to. But basically what it is is it's a choose-your-own-adventure game. Now... At first, I was thoroughly disappointed. I'm not going to lie. And I, not because I think it is bad, but because it is not what I was hoping for, which is what I wanted was a rules light role playing system that I could implement when I wanted to tell a story and get a role playing game going without having to get everybody on board with a rule system. Because half, if, if anybody that's ever tried to teach a role playing group, can tell you whenever that first session is always just explaining rules to the two people that haven't played anything and are just there to drink beer and make characters. This skips over all of that stuff. And it's really almost a deck builder. I don't know. It's a very confusing game. Um, it's not very confusing to play though. It is incredibly accessible to play because there's really only one rule, which is you're going to have a hand of three cards as a player. And when a combat happens, a timer, you'll tap a button on your phone and it will start a timer. And everybody has that much time to pick up their hand of cards, decide what card they want to play and play one card. And if the whole group, if you can't decide fast enough on what you're going to play and you delay things, everybody will take more damage. And then once you, once everybody has decided, you tap the screen, everybody enacts their cards in whatever order they so desire. So there is no initiative. All the players enact all the cards. And then you see what happens. And basically everybody takes X damage. It's like all players take one damage or all players take two damage or something like that. It is um, very, very, very feather light. The only thing that stops it from being a thorough disappointment for me, and this is for me, is that it has a GM mode where it basically allows you to create your own encounters inside the app and then use them to basically GM your own RPG. And I think that has a little bit of possibility, but I haven't had a chance to play that yet because I played everything solo, just playing it a few times to get a vibe for it. It also has user-generated content that I haven't gotten through yet. Basically, there are, uh, users can create modules and, and put them into the app that then other people can play haven't gotten into any of that yet. I can only speak to what is provided with the base game. And it. I'm going to give it a play it because I think I'm not the target demographic and I think I thought it was going to be something different than it actually was. Um, I was hoping for a rules light role playing system and what I got was an app driven choose your own adventure game and that is not the same thing. So I think I allowed my expectations to be I did not manage my expectations well. If you are looking for something very, very feather light to get maybe kids or non-gamers into the concept of a role-playing game, this might be a, a good fit. Um, and I might, I want to revisit this when I've had a chance to use it because I'm going to try and use it once or twice as a GM in its GM mode and see what it does. Um, like if it's a functional way to do that. But other than that, I'm going to call it a play it, uh, but it's feather light and be ready for that. So there you go. <laughs> All right, let's get into our, I, I feel bad for ending on a negative there. It's not really a negative. I mean, a play it is still a positive review. It's just, I feel like I didn't manage expectations well. I want to talk about Maple Games. Now, Daryl, I have been out of the loop this year because my I've been working a lot. And somewhere along the way, I missed everything about Maple Games. Like I missed the advent of it happening. I missed all of the starting game, all of your titles. I know I've heard of them, but I don't know anything. So talk to me like I'm five. Tell me about Maple Games. What? 
Honestly, you haven't missed too much yet, so you're good. <laughs> uh, but I'm happy to catch you up and, uh, and anyone else. Uh, the, the fun thing is Maple Games is a new company that uh, I co-founded with Peter Woken. Uh, for anyone who doesn't know Peter, uh, he is probably one of the graphic designers or artists that is all over your game shelf, but he's mm -hmm. a really humble person. And a lot of people just don't know about him, but he's done a significant amount of titles for like Plaid Hat, Simon, all the floodgates, like a variety of phenomenal games. I got to know Peter through Sagrada. And so um, getting to work with him was a real joy. And I've worked with him on a few others, including actually right behind Patrick is Sakatsu. And I know you mm -hmm. had Isaac on recent, recently, but that was one where um, I was working as a consultant for IDW. And again, um, got to work with Isaac and Matt on their wonderful game. I, I'm a big fan of Sakatsu. And that's, uh, again, Peter uh, was the the art, the graphic designer and artist for that game as well. So uh, we, this summer, um, kind of jumped into the publishing world uh, and said, we're going to try to make some games. And so we looked at games over the kind of the convention season, signed a few games that we fell in love with. And our first game is we just launched on Kickstarter is Dragon Boat to the Four Seas. It's designed by Michael Schock. And uh, it's a beautiful game that thankfully Peter decided to do the art for hit himself to, for our first game. But uh, as we go on, more and more of them were recruiting other artists, and he'll just be the creative director that helps manage the aesthetics and the look and the feel uh, for future games. Not to say that he'll never do art, but that's kind of the idea. And we signed some amazing games. So um, we have Dragon Boats, which I already plugged. We also have, coming up real soon, a game by Chris Leader and Ken Franklin called Imagineers, where you're constructing theme parks with tile laying. It's super fun. All the tiles are double-sided. Either you want to build a theme park with one side or your own roller coaster on the other side. So uh, really accessible. Like We're trying to pick beautiful games that can be really like somewhere in that gateway to medium range, um, have lots of table presence. So uh, those are our first two. And then we just announced on BGG kind of our lineup for, for the year. We, we did a big post of kind of the, the big picture of some of the future titles we have. Which you're going to, I'm sure, send me a link to so I can include it in the description for the video. I would love and to, yeah. I mean, the real short version, I'll tell you real fast, we have a Jay and Sen game um, that actually is with a license, with a comic license called Mind Management. Oh, and the actual yep. creator of Mind Management is a St. Louis guy, and he uh, is the artist and the writer for it, and he's our artist and consultant for the game, so it's really fun to have him involved. We have an original game from Alan Moon and Bobby West, hmm. which we're really excited about, and we just locked down Vincent Detroit, who's going to do the art for it. Um, we have, uh, I'm trying to think, we have like a, a Rob Davio game coming up, uh, we have uh, an original game from a brand new designer, uh, Shannon McDowell. She did a, a trilogy of escape puzzle type room games. So we're psyched about that. And then uh, we're doing the remake of Octopus Garden, uh, which was designed by Roberta Taylor. Um, where we have a, a game about sandcastles from a couple newer designers where you're trying to build up beautiful sandcastles while watching out for kites swooping in and babies tro trolloping through and waves <laughs> wiping out your sandcastle. Uh, so yeah, lots of lots of fun stuff on the docket. I'm really excited. I you know I want everyone to see all the games, but we gotta space them out and and kind of time them out with each production yeah. cycle. I was mm -hmm. going to say that for a new company who who claims that we haven't missed much so far, you sure do have a lot going on already. That's pretty impressive. That's a pretty right. impressive pipe for yeah, a new we, company. We we're trying to set it up, and then we'll you know as we're working away, then each person you know each game kind of slots in, and people can join in and help us you know bring them to reality through Kickstarter, and hopefully people like what we're building and and help us you know bling them out and. Get really cool stretch goals and do all that kind of fun stuff. Sure. So, uh, so the first question that I have to ask Daryl is: You are an a, an an accomplished game designer is a fair way to state your career up to this point, right? Like, I mean, I feel like you've you've done quite a bit in game in the space of game design, 
over the last number of years. And I, uh, lots of your stuff is very, very well thought of. Um, why start a company? Yeah, um, in hindsight, uh, <laughs> I, I had a feeling this was going to go this direction. Yeah, I was like, I already? It was, it was Gil Hova who who said to me he passed it on when when he became a publisher. <laughs> I guess I think Stephen Bonacore said to him like, "You're an idiot, but you'll love it," kind of thing. <laughs> and uh, so Gil kind of passed on those wise words to me as well. Um, but Before yeah, no, or after you decided to do it? Right. Well, pro after I decided. Oh, uh, okay. Think, See, there so, you go. You know, it was a point of no return. But no, to be honest, I like it because it scratches a whole bunch of different itches in that, like, I'm thinking about games in different ways, learning about, you know, understanding the logistics, understanding a game from a product perspective, understanding things from a dev perspective. I feel like all my different experiences with different publishers has helped shape me be able to kind of help along other games now and i've learned from my experiences because so many publishers have been gracious but including me in the process that i kind of i want to pay that forward in all the best ways i can so when i saw different publishers do things certain ways that i thought were amazing then i thought well then let's do more of that let's make our hobby celebrate when people do things in a good way and so we're trying to do that and, and round up people that I think are wonderful people and try to shine some light on their games. So anything from a brand new designer who, you know, I find out they have an amazing game, I want to work with them just as much as I want to work with a veteran designer like Alan Moon or Rob Davio because all of them are incredible people and they're all making incredible games. And if I get an excuse to work with them, I'm going to jump on that. So... Blind enthusiasm. Is yeah. <laughs> fool, fool running into the wind. There you go. You know what? It's I, I I admire it because I think that I think that there are a fair number of people that probably get into the concept of publishing. As a matter of fact, next week we're going to have a first time publisher as our guest on the show. Uh, it's a teaser there. Um, I think that a lot of people get into the act of publishing from a point of enthusiasm and then really have no idea what they're signing on for until it's way too late. And I think that Kickstarter especially has maybe, I don't want to say exacerbated the problem because I don't think it's necessarily Kickstarter's fault, but I think it has shown a light on all of the different ways that it's possible to screw up. <laughs> trying to be a first-time publisher, right? Because there's, well, let's face it, there's yeah. a lot of pitfalls that come in that that uh, play into this. Sure. As a fool running into the wind, as you as you put it, what have you noticed so far has been the biggest challenge that you maybe didn't anticipate? Because you're a smart guy, Daryl. I'm assuming that you came into this with your eyes pretty wide open. We can joke all we want about not about being an idiot, whatever, but you're not stupid. You've been around the game long enough. Ha ha. See what I did there that you, you have some, see, there's the sh head shaking. That's the <laughs> head shaking that I always get. Damn it. Anyway. Um, what what's the the most unexpected hurdle that you've had to get over so far, besides people wanting hats? Yeah, besides people wanting hats, which we we do have an answer for that now. Finally, <laughs> I've been waiting until now to be able to say, hey, you can actually add it on. But excellent. Um, but honestly, I think I think it's just uh, I am still overwhelmed by the amount of quality games that are coming out, and and not so good. I don't get me wrong. <laughs> there's there's a lot of games coming out. But I was I was actually like a little worried uh, when we put out Dragon Boats that I wasn't even sure if we'd fund. You know, at this day and age, like some great games don't do very well on Kickstarter, mm -hmm. and some horrible games do well. So, you know, in that mix, I I think the day we released, there was something like twenty board games that came out on Kickstarter that same day, and probably half of them by established like experienced Kickstarter company. So to be the new kid on the block and be, you know, in double digits, you know, with no mailing list and, you know, not having a track record yet, you know, we, wow. we're, we're throwing ourselves out there saying, Hey, give us a chance. But you know, I'm, I'm a consumer too. And it's not easy to just trust some company that hasn't done it before. You know, even though we're partnering with some great people, you know, I know that, but it's hard for, for a new customer to trust that. So 
I think I think that you're selling yourself a little short when you say that you don't have a track record, though, because, I mean, your name does carry a fair amount of, hey, this guy knows what he's talking about. And mm -hmm. Peter Woken, as you pointed out, we've all seen his work, whether we realize it or not. You know, and I know that even as and I am ashamed to say this as somebody that does not always read the fine print in the credits page of the rule book, I even know who Peter is like sure. and as somebody that only okay. sort of occasionally pays attention to stuff. So, I mean, I don't think that you are, you know, I don't think anybody paying attention is going to be like, I don't know who these guys are. These are well, and that's what we're hoping. We're hoping that we, we built up a bit of a track record of mm -hmm. people that have experienced games from us that, uh, you know, Peter's done or been part of amazing Kickstarters. You, you look at something like Dinosaur Island, uh, where I remember Peter every night saying, oh, I need to make more stretch stretch goal graphics like every night of that campaign and yeah. uh you know we we know how to deal with success which is sometimes ironically something that a lot of companies can't do or or don't know how to do well uh so we're hoping for that while at the same time if we have to you know I, I, i'm a baseball fan so i'll use the analogy if we hit a few singles to start i'm very happy with that if we can make some games and earn our cred you know i'm not expecting a home run out of the gate but it would be nice if we just keep making great quality games and build a track record of people going like, wow, like every time I get one of their games, it's well made. You know, they, they met all the promises they made. And I, I realize it, it, it's going to take a few, a few attempts before, uh, you know, something takes off. Sometimes things take off and uh, those companies don't handle that very well. So we want to be we want to be well prepared. And, you know, I think we are now in a place that we can do kind of each step of the process really well. So two things to point out here. Number one, um, if to torture the metaphor completely, some great Hall of Famers hit nothing but singles their entire career. And number two, the over under on when Daryl would bring up his first baseball baseball <laughs> reference has happened. It was at 938. I don't know who won the pool, but chat room, you can figure it out <laughs> amongst yourselves. I can't resist. I can't resist. <laughs> it's all right. At least I there are certain look look at the ugly ass hat on Brandon's head. And let's tell you everything you need to I, know. I do kind of have a question. Um please with your with your Kickstarter list or your or your list of games that you've got coming, what kind of time frame are we looking at? Um, yeah, no, that's a wonderful question. And one of the cool things, and we mentioned a little bit in our Board Game Geek blog post about our mm -hmm. next kind of 12 months. He posted but that. We okay. we have a we've partnered with a few amazing companies. One, for example, is Crowdox, which is going to help us a lot when it comes to fulfillment. And they've been doing this now for some time. And so they've built up a good track record. Another one on the logistical side is that we're working with uh, people like Fun Again for shipping. And uh, they're teaching us a few things on the shipping side of things. We're working with Surf and Meeple. Uh, so Surf and Meeple has been doing production in China uh, for a long time. One of the great things is actually our CEO um, is also one of the co-founders of Matigo. Mm -hmm. So we're leaning on all the experience and success of a company like Matigo and getting to pick his brain on a regular basis. I talk to him almost every day. And uh, so people like that we have in our corner to help answer and do the logistics. So we're giving ourselves really conservative timelines. We have, for instance, on the Dragon Boats timeline that we're saying, you know, we'll be eight to 12 months and here's step by step, you know, week one, week two, all that. And it's in a nice little chart. But all of that is we put the most, you know, kind of for sure we can hit these deadlines. Our goal is to be even faster than that. So, yeah. so for instance, if we can airship some into shows before or things like that, but our goal is to fulfill as fast as we can, but make sure the quality is there. Yeah. I'm not really concerned about turnaround time. I I'm kind of meaning you've got what nine or 10 titles planned. Yeah. What is your time frame for getting that many out? I mean, yeah. are we looking at because does this give you enough time? And this is my question I like to kind of ask of any publisher. Sure. Does that give you enough time to really push a game to get let it get a foothold? Right. No, that is a wonderful question. One of the reasons we put that pipeline out was to get people excited now about some of the future titles because we mm -hmm. know every game's not going to connect with every gamer. Yeah. Uh, so so we actually have like for instance uh, like a, a complexity scale that we're putting on our games and we're kind of mm -hmm. like weaving some of the lighter stuff, some of the heavier stuff. So for instance, our next game is kind of the lightest we do and we're hoping to put that on Kickstarter in in a month month and a half. Okay. So we're gonna we're gonna probably pop out a game every couple months is kind of our our, 
our timeline but is your hope is it's different, different audiences and you can but still- they're going to be different audience you got it exactly so so that the person who's really into light games they're mm-hmm. not going to you know every third kickstarter will be a light game okay so really they're waiting kind of six months well mm-hmm. that last one fulfilled okay hopefully. so that you know you saw that light game come out and now the, here's the next one yeah and if we space them out that way our goal is you we know most people are not going to buy every game if we're lucky, maybe we'll get one of them. Yeah, that connects with them, and then next year they'll do another one. As long as we do our job of delivering a really good quality game. Okay. But that's the that's our that's our approach is that yeah. we're going to try to try to make games. I have a wide breadth of games that I like, but I know some are going to be on the light side. Some are going to be heavy. So, like for instance, our game coming up, uh, Mind Management. Okay. It's a hidden movement game. I've played this game. I think I'm. A, the last game I played was my 30th game I played <laughs> yesterday. Um, and it, I grew up where Scotland Yard was like my favorite game when I was a kid. This scratches that itch for me all over again, but it's, cl- it's even more clever. And the fun part for me is that's going to be a gamer's game. Like people are going to fall in love with it. If you like hidden movement type games, this is a game that I'm confident people will love. It's designed by Jay and Sam. They've been working on it for years and I'm still, we wanted to make sure it was perfect. So even though we knew we could have put it out in the summer, right when we started, we said, no, 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 let's wait till January, make sure it's fine tuned like crazy and then bring it out in the new year. So we're trying to make sure that nothing's rushed. Everything comes out when the dev is done. Okay. So that's what, that's also okay. part of why we spaced yep. out. It's, like, you know, yeah. one of those things you see like shotgun, basically, you know, yep. one after the other, and then some poor designer gets forgotten who has a really quality game, but yeah, spreading it out. So hopefully they get the equal att- attention. Yeah. That's the, that's the goal. Also, we're trying to build worlds. So some of these games we're hoping to circle around again too, because cool. we've invested into that world. So yep. right on. There's, there's definitely, there are certain publishers that when you see um, their Kickstarter track record where they have run five Kickstarters and haven't delivered one game yet and people, the eyebrows start getting a little bit raised. Yep. And I think that that's, that's the other trap. And it doesn't, it's not really a trap, but I mean, it's the other thing where you're like, well, we don't want to, we don't want people to, um, you know, feel like all we're doing is taking wads of cash and not actually fulfilling. The good news is that with the track record that that uh, the names that you have on board add credibility and will hopefully fend off some of that right out the gate, right? Not just you, but yeah, Peter and you know, uh, Just Davis is a fairly well known uh, face in the in the hobby. I would argue, at least I knew who she was, which was exciting. Um, and I always feel like I'm the bottom level, right? Like if I know something, then probably everybody knows it because I barely, I'm, I'm kind of dumb sometimes. So like, is that a concern for you? I guess is this, uh, is making sure that you're not over promising too many things and then falling behind. I know yeah. that you said that you're, you're no, no, that's, conservative, that's a really great question. And it was something that even while we were planning, I mean, we, we started, as I mentioned, planning already in the summer, we wanted to give ourselves lots of runway. Mm-hmm. before we didn't want to release something right away. We wanted to start working on all of them. One thing that I experienced as just a freelance designer that was discouraging was some games I signed, I found publishers did not necessarily take the time to develop games. So we wanted to give ourselves lots of runway to keep developing games, getting games to the right place. We now have a bunch of games that we feel like are at the right place that now we're starting to then think through how can we market them? How can we produce them? at the top quality. And so, yeah, we were very mindful of early on, like let's not promise and let's not sign even a lot of games. So our, our, our goal is we don't want a lineup of 50 games. Um, unfortunately, there's a lot of publishers that have that yeah. mm-hmm. where they're planning two, three years down the road. Our goal was one of the things we said was let's make sure we're in single digits that we're actually committing to making these games as great as they can be. Yeah, we're going to pr- pop them out as fast as we can. But to your point, we don't want to go too fast or too slow. That was one of our reasons for kind of doing the diversity of the kind of difficulties and tastes. But also, we want to make sure we give those games ju- you know, their due justice. So, so one of the things that we've been telling people is, you know, as we get them right away on, onto BGG, subscribe and follow along the titles that interest you right away. 
you know, things like that. Keep following along. But we're already we're already working on some of the games that are, you know, six, eight, twelve months away. We're still working on that on a regular basis uh, in our playtest sessions because we already know, you know, those things are going to creep up on us before you know it. So. Right. That's that's good. And I don't I hope that didn't come off as me being like, you better deliver on all the things that you promise. So I don't mean it that way. No, we we do. We better. <laughs> I yeah. mean, well, I mean, honest, yes, I, you better. That's, but that's our, our putting our names out there is that we have a commitment to backers to perform and to deliver and not to over promise. So we're trying to be real smart about it. And each Kickstarter we do, we're going to learn from and we're going to adjust the plan and you know, step by step. If there's ever a title that we think we need to take some time, then we'll take some time. We'll delay it. I'd much rather delay and make sure we do exactly what we say. And it's and there's the other way to look at this is that if you have, let's say, 10 games that you already know you want to do, it's just a matter of when to do them. Right. And one of the games somewhere along this list comes across a, a stumbling block that you hadn't anticipated. Yeah, you have a backup plan so that way you can keep your Absolutely. business rolling. Yeah, you know, and and not that any game would be a backup mm -hmm. plan, but I mean a game that you can slot in to keep your your business model moving and yep. still give every game the attention which it deserves. I think that's yeah, no, that's, I think that's exactly what we're trying to do. So some of the some of the ones later in the schedule, you know, we're we're open to those moving around in order if they need to. Gotcha. Very cool. Uh, yeah, and. Brandon I typed it in the chat, and I agree wholeheartedly. Uh, design and development, more important to me than anything else. I'd rather wait for excellent games and keep hitting it hit with average games. The signal-to-noise ratio is awful. Yeah. I keep coming back to that graph that went that made the rounds about a month and a half ago about the number of releases by year and just Crazy. the ridiculous yeah. spike that we are in right now. I don't mm -hmm. – it's a great problem to have, I guess, but yeah. – Man, oh man, like uh, anybody that has FOMO in 2018 needs right. to just have a <laughs> cookie and a nap right. because there is so much out there that you are going to miss out on stuff, right? Like, and but the good news is half of what you're missing out on, you're okay having missed because yeah. it's not great. <laughs> how, many, how many games are coming out at Essen? 800? 1100. 1100. 1100 on the list. 1100, 1100 games coming yeah. out in one weekend. Just, <laughs> every, every, some of this is demo. You know, you, you drop yeah. it down. But yeah, it's okay, still the sure. same amount of games. Let's say that three quarters of them are demo. Let's be super ambitious and say that three quarters of those games are just demos. That is still 275 games because I can do math. Coming out in one weekend, you don't have time to play. I if I could get two hundred and seventy five games played in a calendar year, I would be ecstatic. Yeah, even if they're little, dear sweet baby Jesus, it's too much. So I would rather, like I, I don't know. I you know what? Everybody likes to joke about me being the curmudgeon on the show, and I'm. Uh, it's fine. It is a. It's a. It's a burden I'm willing to to shoulder. <laughs> but I, it's exhausting. So the idea that there is a publisher led by a designer, I don't know, led by President Daryl Andrews, is that fair? Can I, Did you see can that? I, that was pretty yeah, yeah, he is the president. I have the Maple Games website up right here mm -hmm. where the most presidential smile I've ever seen in my life is currently on display. And by that, I mean, it's one of Daryl's trademark enthusiastic selfies. Um, <laughs> Daryl, you're my hero. But um, yeah, it, having a publisher led by a designer and a creative director and whatever that know the business and know that quality matters, I yeah. think is a big deal. And Thank I you. just, I want to see, I, I, I've said this a number of times on the show and I'll continue to say it. I always like seeing good things happen to good people. And you are definitely good people, but I'd rather see great games made by good people. Yeah. And I'm really excited for this. Um, yeah, I, 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 that's our goal. That's exactly what we're trying to do is, is make sure we're making high quality games that people can be proud to spend their money on because games are expensive and there's a lot out there. And if we can just at least be a trustworthy provider of fun, uh, that, then I get to do my dream job the rest of my life. Yeah. And I got to say, 
being able to launch with a Michael Shock title mm-hmm. with a with the Bamboozle Brothers game right coming on its heels is not a bad way to start. Yeah, we we are blessed with some good friends too. So the the opportunity to work with some really talented people, I I don't take for granted. Yeah, even if they're Canadian. Even <laughs> hey <Yeah>. hey now, <laughs> as somebody that very briefly lived in Canada for a while, I protest mightily. You don't get a claim it, Bill. <laughs> I, don't. I don't. Come on. I'm just. But I know what licks is. Does that count? Room. Yeah, that counts. <laughs> yeah, it does. Licks doesn't exist anymore, does it? Did I hear that? I yeah, heard that. I love that place, but no. Oh my god, it was amazing. Yeah. Maybe the best burger I've ever had in my life. And I was stupid and ordered the double the first time I went there. <laughs> yeah, wow, you're taking me back. I totally <laughs> forgot about Licks. That was, that was my childhood burger joint. Yeah. Oh, it was the best. Although I will say you had to wear sunglasses when you walked in for the first time because it was the brightest colored place in the world. Basically take <laughs> McDonald's and put it on LSD and it's just yeah. all bright red and bright yellow. It was amazing. Yeah. All right. So Dragon Boats of the Four Seas is your launch title. It's on Kickstarter right now. Uh-huh. Doing very it's a, well. It's a Michael. It's doing very well on Kickstarter right now. Um, I may or may not have literally backed it while we were sitting here talking. I'm just throwing that out there. Oh, um, thank you. Hey, man, anytime I get a, this game is gorgeous. So I'll be honest with you. I don't back things just because friends are making them. But holy cow, this game is pretty. Yeah, we're we're really psyched. I mean, it's it's really fun. Actually, all the all the art has been done live on Twitch. Peter has been doing it yep. so people can watch. They can even participate. He's still finishing the board. And he's even putting people's names as Easter eggs into the board. And it's it's incredible to watch him. He is so crazy talented. And then personally, I'm super excited about the 3D dragon boats. They're uh they're pretty cool looking. Yeah, they're they're, 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 they're the first thing that jumped out at me when I looked at this. This thing is gorgeous. Um, go ahead. Is that just in the deluxe or is that in the basic? I'm no, just... so we're doing four uh 3D dragon boats, even in the base. We wanted everyone to experience it. The okay. deluxe, you get a couple extra cool ones, and then we added a bunch of different uh, variants to the gameplay that okay. we added uh, just to add like layers of complexity, and you can modular mix and match some of the different features in the deluxe box if you want. What our goal is, is anything that's in the deluxe box, this is your one chance to buy it as a deluxe box. Mm-hmm. If the game does well enough, which this one has already at least reached its funding goal, our goal is to put the base model out in retail, and then we'll do an expansion box. It'll always work out a little more expensive to buy the base game and the expansion than buying the deluxe. But the deluxe is your chance right off the bat to make sure you get everything. Okay. But we know sometimes you can't afford to buy the deluxe version. We don't want people to feel you know, that you've missed out. If you want to space it out and buy just the base for now, you can get the deluxe, most of the deluxe features in an expansion box down the road. Yeah. So nothing is truly Kickstarter exclusive. That's our goal is some stuff direct exclusive and that you get it early, but you can buy it later by one means or another, either through retail or directly from our website. Uh, mm-hmm. Because, you know, we know gamers are collectors and I don't want to punish someone who maybe can't pay for everything up front. There's a lot of Kickstarters out there and people have budget. So if you want to just get the base now, and you want to get that other stuff later, you can. It won't work out to be the cheapest scenario, but mm-hmm. but you can space well, it out then. This isn't Canadian dollars, so this is like free anyway. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to make that joke. I'm so glad you did. I, I, it, you know what? It, we, we make the joke, but it does, for American Kickstarter backers that might think about it, do, do remember that that is in Canadian dollars, so it's not. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, that's uh, you'd be surprised how many people I've talked to that don't realize that sort of thing. And I'm like, hundred dollars. We what? did try. We did try to put a lot of stuff in there to show like the U.S. dollar amount as well in the page so that people can see that quick because we know definitely our 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 major market is the U.S. market. Oh yeah, it says it right there. About fifty three dollars U.S. Yeah. So, okay. so, so it, we worked it out so it does kind of like all that kind of stuff as much as possible. I got a a post today from. I can't remember what country, but they were asking for it to be in some other currency. And I had to apologize and say, like, look, I can't do every currency out there. We're already a Canadian company, so we have to show Canadian. You know, mm-hmm. we're, we've translated some of this into U.S. You know, worst case, if you're confused, I'm happy to help one way or another. I'll work out the currency exchange for you personally, but 
Yeah. Or, you know, type it in Google, people. Type, yeah. type it into Google. It's not really that it. hard. <laughs> like, if you, mm, I don't know. People, I, that's a whole nother rant for another day on people <laughs> that can get on part of the internet, but apparently not puzzle out the rest of it. And whatever. It's fine. All right. So, if you had to give, I feel like I should ask Jess this in the in the chat instead of asking you. She's your she's your uh, your social media person, but I'm going to ask you anyway because here you are. Um, what's your What's your 15 second pitch for Dragon Boats? Yeah, my my 15 second pitch is Dragon Boats is an elegant game with lots of interesting choices. It's beautiful, and you can play this with friends, family, coworkers, and have a really good time. It always is an hour or less. And you'll be surprised with the different paths you might take. One of you might win. <laughs> One of you might win? <laughs> is there a chance that nobody wins? Well, not maybe you. Okay. Right. Very good. Very good. I'm excited. Once again, the link for this is down in the description for this here YouTube video. So uh, please feel free to click that and go check it out. And if you feel like you can spare a few bucks, Go back it because I think it looks awesome. And Michael Schock games are always solid. Yeah, he's one of those designers that you really can't go wrong with his stuff. I have yet to play a Shock that I thought was not good. Yep. No, so. I, I would say the same. Perfect. All right, <clears throat> sir Daryl Andrews, are uh -huh. you prepared for the best part of the show? And by the oh, best are part, we I there mean already. This... Yeah, we're there already. Oh, it's rapid fire time. It is rapid. I like, see, he knew. That oh. means that he's paid attention to the show before. I'm so excited. All right. Let's see what I can do. Jess, pay attention to this and make fun of him mercilessly later when he screws this <laughs> up. Yep. Patrick, go for it. All right. There are two rules. Or, there's probably 12 rules for rapid fire. There's two things I'm going to go over for rapid fire. One, you may not repeat the question back to me or him and Ha trying to get some more time, and you may not use the same answer twice. Ah. Are you ready for rapid fire? I'm never ready, but let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> we got faith. Hey, it's, you know, I'm just here to have fun. That's all. Hey, it's it's uh, Canadian Thanksgiving. If you're going to have seconds at Thanksgiving, what are you going to have? Stuffing with cranberry sauce. Awesome. Hey, my maple tree in my backyard has red leaves. Name a game with red player pieces. <laughs> Go with <laughs> wow! I am horrible. <laughs> Nations. All right. Uh, besides bloody and name a spooky game. Uh, fearsome floors. Nice. Name the best tile laying game. Carcassonne. Name a game you are looking forward to coming out at Essen. Uh, the Uwe Raffen something. I don't know how you even say it, but Uwe Rosenberg's got this new game that's like Iceland themed or something. Reichold. There you Thank go. You. Don't know that how to work. say it. Oh, sorry. I'm not supposed to be answering. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> thousand games. You could have said anything. In Uwe. Yeah. Literally three quarters of the things on your shelf. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Nice. Oh, man. Red. Other than a game with red in it. Yeah. I mean, how hard is that? Yeah. That's the easiest question, too. I should have said, like, <laughs> risk. Ugh. That's okay. You did great. <laughs> nice. Nice. And the pressure's well, on. Daryl, that was wonderful. And by wonderful, I mean slightly hard to watch, but <laughs> super fun. Daryl, in the chat room? It, uh, we've been invaded by bots, which is kind of fun. I don't really know really? how that happened. Wow. Not bots, just spammers. That's neat. Okay. And by neat, I mean sort of annoying. Yeah, that's a that's crazy. All right, thank you, Brandon, for for Managing wielding it. wielding the the moderator hammer. I appreciate that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, Daryl. If people want to know more about all of this stuff, besides the link that we posted earlier, where would we send them? Yeah, I mean, obviously, we've already plugged the Kickstarter. So other places you can find Maple Games. Uh, we're on most of the social media channels, so you can find us on Twitter. Uh, if you just search Maple Board Games, uh, you can find us on on Facebook. You can find us on Instagram. You know, you look for Maple Board Games, you'll find us one way or another on all those channels. We also have a website. Uh, the cool thing is, it's just Maple Dot Games. That's all you got to type, and you can find us. Uh, real easy there. Um, otherwise, 
I, I mentioned it before, but I'll mention it again. Uh, if you're on BGG, subscribe to our upcoming games. It's a great way to keep keep track of the games that you're interested in, and uh, follow you know follow us on all those kind of traditional social media channels. I was waiting nice. for the Maple Maple Dot Games. I'm that is wonderful. Yeah, we, like, I was pretty excited about it. Yeah, you should be. That's amazing. And then you yourself, if people just want to know know more about, yeah. You, it's, I'm I'm happy to connect with people. the e The easiest one is on Twitter. It's Daryl Mandrews. Uh, so Daryl M. Andrews. So that's thank you. One thank that, you for saying that. It's Every the easiest one to remember. Uh, so yeah, so you can find me on Twitter or on Facebook. You know, I I pretty much add anyone who's a gamer. You know, uh, at deep down in my heart, I just love interacting with our community. Especially, you know, I love interacting with designers. We we. We have a, a pretty cool network of designers that share, you know, helping each other. And, and I've been helped by a lot. So if there's anyone out there that has questions, please just add me. And, you know, if you have questions, uh, you know, I'd love to share my experiences and you can learn from my mistakes or, or my successes. And, uh, yeah, so those are, those are probably the easiest ways is, is Facebook or Twitter. Um, yeah. Is, are you still doing Meeple Syrup regularly? I'm not on maple syrup anymore. Okay. Thankfully, it's still going strong. Sen Fong Lim, my co-host, mm -hmm. has uh, been leading the charge. And uh, the two replacements that jumped in are Jesse and Erica, who are both good friends of mine. And they have been doing a phenomenal job. Anyone who doesn't know, Jesse does some co-design with Sen. And they did uh, the... Um, oh, what's that? Fighting? Legend of Korra Pro Bending Arena. Thank you. Yes. They were on the show. Awesome. Mm -hmm. So Pro Bending was an incredible game they co-designed. They're they working on a few other titles. And then Erica, I've done some co-design with. She's a phenomenal designer and will be on many game boxes in years to come because she's prolific and very talented as well. So the three of them are doing a great job with Meeple Syrup Show, and it's really fun to just tune in and watch it continue. And I'm and I and I knew that you weren't on the show anymore. I was plugging it because I think maple syrup is awesome, and yeah. maple syrup is sort of was always sort of the inspiration behind the reboot of the Cubist. The, yeah. the, the maple syrup did this format first, but yeah. smarter. Like they just <laughs> like just bigger brains. But other than that, it's basically the same format. So oh, if yes. you ever get a chance, uh, those of you that enjoy YouTube, especially if you want to take a look at gaming from a design centric standpoint maple syrup is your jam like we are we come at this from the end user standpoint more often than not here on the cubist uh but sure. maple syrup comes at it from the origin side of things so if you are curious about uh, design strategy from really smart people that's a solid show so anyway sorry i was using you as a stepping stone I, to a segue. Ha I will happily segue to maple syrup anytime <laughs> plus it just makes me want maple maple syrup so i'll mm. go with the pun and the connection outstanding and i want a hat i'm just throwing that i'm gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna get a damn hat i want the hat look we all have hats on the show now all right so we did all of your plugs uh brandon anything you want to plug no nah, you can find me where are you find me find <laughs> me like ptw um uh, go listen to the shuffle uh, we just dropped patrick and eric in the morning this morning who are they um, uh, I don't know. There's some mm -hmm. yahoos we just gave 30 minutes to, and they talk about weird things like secret agents and um, Tom Clancy TV shows. And <laughs> <laughs> nice. But it's good fun. It is good fun. Go listen. Patrick, he just stole your plug. That's quite all right. Hey, I'm Patrick Hillier. I'm over the Hillier on Twitter. And I just did a plug for the shuffle in the chat room because they were chatting about... Um, Kanban and Netters did a really fun oh, right. story about. Um, You're gonna forget her name too. Kanban. Uh, what's the what her name? name? <laughs> I haven't played it, so I can't remember her name. You're the official mispronouncer of that. Mean, mean, not the, the mean lady. Oh, mean lady. I listened to it like Sandra. Yeah, Sandra. there you go. Mean yeah, Sandra. Mean Sandra. She's yeah. a really funny short story about Mean Sandra. You guys gotta <laughs> nice. go listen to it. Nice. Yes, and thank you, Paul. Paul just reminded I us. Remember. To, okay, and we uh, are we are a proud member of Punchboard Media, where we all bring something, something to the table. Time for the mumble. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> mumble, 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 because we're all terrible at this stuff. <laughs> hey, don't forget if you, those of you that are subscribed on YouTube, which you all should be subscribe on YouTube. Um, if you are already subscribed on YouTube, you may have noticed that there is a second event for tonight. That's because we are doing our After Dark episode. Uh, this evening, normally it would have been last week, but I was near death. 
uh, from being way overtired, so we pushed it back a week. So we're going to do After Dark right after this episode, so stay tuned, uh, and you'll see us go live in just a few minutes. But in the meanwhile, thank you so much. If you want to support the show, you can go to thecubispodcast.com or to our page either on PodPledge or Patreon. Both of those are still working because I'm lazy and I still haven't taken down the Patreon page. Uh, thank you so much to everybody that does support the show. Buy some merch, and we will see you on the other side in the After Dark show. So everybody, have a great week of gaming for those of us that can't join us, and we will see you all again next time. Be good. Bye. Thanks, Daryl.